Hello, Namaskar. This is First Post and you're watching Vantage with me, Palki Sharma. We're still tracking Pakistan. It's more drama than we signed up for. Imran Khan's candidates have come on top, but they cannot form the government. They're not a party. Nawaz Sharif has a party with the most number of seats, but he cannot form the government because he doesn't have enough seats. Coalition talks are on, so our protests and court cases may follow. We'll try to make sense of the mess for you. For India, the day began with good, with good news. Eight Indians who were on death row in Qatar have been pardoned. Most of them are back home. It's a win for India's quiet diplomacy. Meanwhile, Chinese companies in India are complaining. The likes of Xiaomi are under scrutiny. Paytm too for the Chinese money in it. In Indonesia, the stage is set for the world's biggest single day election ever. In Israel, Prime Minister Netanyahu wants to storm Rafah. What's his strategy and why aren't his allies on board? Donald Trump has spoken about NATO. Europe is worried. The White House has called him unhinged. Myanmar has made military service compulsory as the junta struggles against the rebels. West Africa's most stable democracy, Senegal, is witnessing chaos after the postponement of elections. Elon Musk wants to colonize Mars. And how does science explain Monday blues? Also, how do you find motivation? We'll discuss that. The headlines first. The Netherlands to stop delivering parts for the F-35 fighter jets to Israel. These planes are being used by Israel to bomb Gaza. A Dutch court says it could amount to breaking international law. The ruling sided with human rights groups who have accused Israel of violations. After France, India launches UPI, Unified Payments Interface Services in Sri Lanka and Mauritius. Prime Minister Modi joins the launch virtually along with his Mauritian counterpart and Sri Lankan president. Today, rupee cards were also introduced in Mauritius. Another blow to the opposition in India before the election, former Maharashtra Chief Minister Ashok Chavan leaves the Congress party. He's likely to join the ruling BJP. Chavan is the last leader, latest leader rather, to dump the Congress just months before the election. The Democratic Republic of Congo beefs up security at embassies. On Saturday, protesters targeted cars belonging to embassies and the United Nations. They accused the West of supporting M23 rebels in the conflict-ridden East. U.S. Defense Chief Lloyd Austin hospitalized again. Austin, who is battling prostate cancer, was admitted to the critical care unit. On Sunday, he transferred his duties to his deputy. Austin has come under fire for keeping his previous hospital stays a secret. And US President Joe Biden joins TikTok before the election. This is despite the White House banning government agencies from using the app. TikTok is owned by Chinese firm ByteDance. It has been accused of spying for Beijing. Elections are over. It's now coalition time in Pakistan. Last week, the army script nearly went wrong. So they're writing a new one now. And this script has just one objective, to keep Imran Khan out of power. We're seeing a lot of negotiations happening. First, Nawaz Sharif hosted the MQMP. It's a political party based in Karachi. Then came the big meeting. Former Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif met the Bhuttos. He was welcomed in Lahore by Bilawal Bhutto Zardari. They hugged, exchanged pleasantries, and then got down to business. Looks like a coalition is being worked out. The Pakistan People's Party and the Pakistan Muslim League together. Both sides agreed to cooperate. They also resolved to save Pakistan from political instability. I guess that means a coalition. But will the numbers work out? Let's look at the final results. Candidates backed by Imran Khan lead the way. They won 101 seats. Nawaz Sharif's PMLN got 75 seats. And the Bhutto's PPP got 54. At number four, you have the MQMP, which has 17 seats. Now, Pakistan's National Assembly, their parliament, has 266 members. So the majority mark is 134. If you add PMLN, that's Nawaz Sharif's party, and the PPP, Bhutto's party, you get a total of 129. Just five seats short of majority. And where will those five seats come from? There are many options right now. Maybe the MQM can join in, or maybe some independence can be poached. 
And that's already happening. We're seeing evidence of that. Six independents have already joined Nawaz Sharif's party. Many more could be on the way. So looks like Pakistan's new government will be a coalition. PPP plus PMLN, the Sharifs and the Bhutto Zardaris coming together again. The same equation as before. Both these parties together toppled Imran Khan in 2022. Now they could be back together. How is Imran Khan's PTI reacting to this? With anger. On Thursday night, they were winning the election. But three days later, they could be in opposition. So Imran Khan's supporters are angry. They held protests across major Pakistani cities. Even key highways were, were blocked. Take a look at this. So what happens next? More coalition talks. Even if an alliance is struck, the final details will have to be worked out. Who gets key cabinet posts, who becomes prime minister, and what will be the policy direction? All of that will have to be worked out. It won't be a comfortable conversation. After all, Bilawal Bhutto Zardari had rejected the idea before the elections. He said he would not be foreign minister under Nawaz Sharif. But now he's got leverage. Reports say his father, Asif Ali Zardari, wants to be president again. Bilawal himself has prime ministerial ambitions. So the coalition talks will be interesting. But they won't be the only challenge. Two problems will follow. Number one, a looming judicial standoff. Pakistani courts are flooded with election cases. Many PTI candidates have filed complaints. They say they are the rightful winners. मेरे जो वोट बन रहे वो 55000 वोट है मेरी مخالف का जो रिजल्ट है वो 17000 वोट है तो मुझे उम्मीद है कि मैं ये आवामी احتجاج पे जारी रखेंगे हम और कोर्ट का भी दरवाजा खटखटाएंगे अदलिया से हमें आखिरी उम्मीद है कि अदलिया इसके ऊपर एक्शन लेंगे और जो 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 जीते हकीकत में लोगों ने जिसको वोट दिया उसको इंशाल्लाह जिताएंगे उनको रिजल्ट देंगे तो ये हमारा مطالبہ है it will take time to settle all of this. A lot will depend on Imran Khan. Will he keep the street protests going or will he hit pause? That decision will determine Pakistan's near future. Problem number two, the economic path ahead. Pakistan's current crisis needed a strong government, possibly a single party regime. That would have made bailout talks a lot easier. Also, radical policies often require a clear majority, a clear direction. But that's out of the window now. We're looking at a bits and pieces government. A lot of bickering, a lot of uncertainty, and a lot of indecision. Even Pakistan's stock market has realized that. On Friday, it lost 1,200 points. Today, again, it plunged by 1,800 points. So the markets have understood the big picture. It's going to be a troubled period for Pakistan. The first priority will be cobbling up a government. Then comes economic recovery. But what about the long term? 50 years later, how will we look at this election? The vote itself was a blow to the army. It showed how unpopular the generals were. But don't expect their role to change. If anything, they could meddle more. And I'll tell you why I say this. Both the Sharifs and the Bhuttos have been rejected by the people. Nawaz Sharif actually lost one of his two seats. So chances are, the new government will be deeply unpopular. It will struggle for legitimacy. And such unstable Pakistani regimes often depend on the army for stability, for direction, and also for control. So the generals are not going anywhere. Their grip on the country may have slipped a bit. But they've reminded the world of Pakistan's eternal truth. Never bet against the army. And speaking of placing bets, would you invest in a Chinese company? If you're a regular in the, in the stock market, chances are you'll steer clear of anything Chinese at the moment. Globally, investors are pulling back from China's market. And these investors are doing so because they're apprehensive. Chinese stocks are rapidly losing their value, and this sentiment applies to Chinese investments in India as well. They're increasingly being viewed with suspicion. The broad sentiment is negative, and it's getting worse by the day. Two leading names are in trouble, Xiaomi and Paytm. Both are market leaders. Xiaomi is among the leading smartphone sellers in India, while Paytm is synonymous with digital payments. But both companies are under the lens now because of their Chinese connections.
We'll start with Xiaomi. This company has raised a concern. Xiaomi officials have written a letter to the government of India. It is about smartphone component suppliers. Xiaomi says these suppliers are wary of setting shop in India. I have a quote from that letter. This is what it says. There are apprehensions among component suppliers regarding establishing operations in India. Stemming from the challenges faced by companies in India, particularly from Chinese origin. Xiaomi India's president has signed this letter. And what are the apprehensions? The company did not really spell them out. Reports say Xiaomi is concerned about compliance and visa issues. But towards the end, the statement really gives it away. Here's what it says. Challenges faced by companies in India, particularly from Chinese origin. That's what Xiaomi is worried about. India's security, India's scrutiny rather, of Chinese companies. That's what they don't like. Their rise in India was rapid, but in recent years, Xiaomi has had some run-ins with the law. In 2022, Indian officials froze their assets, assets worth over $600 million. They were frozen. Do you know why? Because Xiaomi is said to have violated Indian laws by remitting some money illegally. So company assets were frozen. Last year, Xiaomi moved court against this decision, but a judge rejected their appeal. Then you have Vivo, another Chinese smartphone maker that has faced scrutiny. Just like Xiaomi, Vivo too is accused of remitting money illegally. It was also pulled up for visa violations. Reports say 30 Chinese executives of Vivo came to India. They were given business visas, but when they applied, these executives hid the fact that they worked for Vivo. Plus, some of these employees ended up traveling to Jammu and Kashmir, which was a breach of their business visa provisions. Because Jammu and Kashmir is a sensitive region. Foreigners cannot just travel there. They need permission for it. In addition to a visa, they need a special permit to visit regions like Jammu and Kashmir. Vivo employees violated these rules. So India had valid reasons to investigate. But China does not see it this way. Beijing says Chinese companies are facing discrimination. Listen to this. China hopes that India can fully understand the mutually beneficial nature of the bilateral economic and trade cooperation and provide a fair, just, transparent business environment for Chinese enterprises there. If that was indeed the case, India wouldn't have cleared 80 Chinese FDI projects in 2022. 80 projects were cleared, 8-0. India doesn't have a problem with Chinese investment. It has an issue with shady and murky transactions. And that's the reason why Paytm2 is facing scrutiny. The Indian fintech giant, it is facing regulatory trouble. We've been telling you about this. Paytm has been put on notice by India's central bank. It has run afoul of compliances. But for many years, Paytm has ignored warnings from authorities. And now it faces a potential ban from the payment space. Multiple payment services on the app could shut down in March. Paytm is also facing scrutiny for its Chinese links. The company has a Chinese investor. Jack Ma led Ant Group invested in Paytm, although last year they reduced their stakes. Now they own less than 10% of the shares in Paytm. Now reports say the government of India has set up a panel. It will look into Chinese investments in Paytm, among other things. Moral of the story? Rule of law may be an alien concept for China, but India's message on that front is quite clear. This is non-negotiable. If a Chinese company or investor wants to do business in India, they'll have to follow the rule book. Well, China is an exception. Most countries have a good rapport with India. It's not by fluke, though. It's the result of consistent diplomacy. Look at what happened in Qatar. Eight Indian sailors had been jailed by Doha. All of them were former Indian Navy personnel, and the charges were quite serious. Some reports said espionage. At first, Qatar sentenced them to death. But India did not give up. New Delhi used quiet diplomacy behind the scenes. And today we saw the results. Seven of the eight sailors are back in India. They have been freed by Qatar. How exactly did that happen? How did a death sentence turn to release? Listen to what the sailors think. We're extremely grateful to the Honorable Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi ji. It certainly wouldn't have been possible without his uh, personal intervention and that equation with uh, the Emir of Qatar. Uh, I think we are grateful to the government of India, the bottom of our heart, for the every effort that has been made. And this day wouldn't have been possible without it. 
So diplomacy worked. The sailors think Prime Minister Modi personally intervened. Even the government has hinted at this. The External Affairs Ministry has thanked the ruler of Qatar. It has also said Prime Minister Modi was personally overseeing the issue. We are uh, grateful for their return. We are gratified on their return. Uh, we deeply appreciate uh, the uh, decision of the Qatari's government and the Amir to release them. Honorable Prime Minister has himself personally constantly supervised all the developments in this case uh, and has uh, never shied away from any initiatives that would ensure the return of uh, uh, Indian nationals uh, back to home. And what about the eighth sailor? He too has been released, but his return to India is still being worked out, so the job is almost done. Now let's take a step back and look at a few important questions. Why were these sailors jailed? Why was the case dropped? And what is the political impact of this diplomatic win? These sailors were arrested in 2022. All of them worked for the same company, Dara Global, in Doha. Now, Qatar did not reveal the charges against them, neither did India. But media reports said it was espionage. Apparently, they were spying for Israel. In the months that followed, India got consular access to these men. New Delhi tried to get them released, but no luck. In October 2023, the sailors were sentenced to death. India decided to appeal that verdict. Then in early December, a key meeting happened. Prime Minister Modi and Qatar's Emir were in Dubai. Both were attending the COP28 summit. They held a brief discussion on the sidelines, and chances are this issue, the issue of the sailors, was also discussed in that meeting. But did it work? Well, later that month, the death sentence was reversed. Around 50 days later, the sailors are back home. So I guess the Dubai conversation did work. But we don't know how the sailors were released. Was it a court deciding to free them? Or was it a pardon by the Emir? The Foreign Secretary refused to answer that question, but chances are it was a pardon. Qatar's Emir issues pardons twice a year. Most of the freed prisoners are foreigners. And India's statement vaguely hints at this. Let me quote from what India said. We appreciate the decision by the Emir of the state of Qatar to enable the release and homecoming of these nationals. Either way, it was a political call. Qatari courts do not randomly release alleged spies, not unless the Emir tells them to do so. But this success goes beyond just one short interaction in Dubai. It is the result of sustained policy, a genuine outreach to the Muslim world. And now is the perfect time to talk about it. Tomorrow, the Prime Minister of India is embarking on a tour, a foreign tour, possibly his last big one before the general election. And where is he going? The UAE and Qatar. In the UAE, he will inaugurate a massive Hindu temple and meet with the diaspora. In Qatar, he will meet the Emir, Tamim ibn Hamad al Thani. Think of it as a gratitude tour. And that's been a feature of India's outreach. It's come at the highest level of government. Prime Minister Modi has visited the UAE six times. Two of those visits came in the last eight months. He's visited Saudi Arabia twice. Bahrain, Oman, Jordan and Qatar once. This will be his second trip to Qatar. Now these relations have been mutually beneficial. India is the third largest oil consumer in the world. It's a key market for Gulf nations. Then you have the diaspora. Around 9 million Indians live and work in the Gulf. They're holding up local economies. Trade and investments are also important. The India-UAE trade is around $85 billion. The India-Qatar trade is worth $20 billion. A big chunk of that is LNG, that's liquefied natural gas. Around 48% of India's LNG imports are from Qatar, almost half. And last week, both sides renewed a deal. India will keep importing LNG from Qatar until 2048. That's the deal. It's a massive energy deal worth $78 billion. So there's a strong foundation to the diplomatic ties. Yes, personal outreach has helped, but the underlying foundation is also good. Sizable trade, solid investments, and a large diaspora. It's what we call a win-win relationship. The Gulf gets a reliable customer. India gets a foothold in a geopolitically significant region. Plus, it's a political statement. Western media has questioned the safety of Muslims in India, but the same Indian government is celebrated in the Gulf. 
Prime Minister Modi has received civilian honors from multiple nations there, like the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Palestine. That investment has clearly paid off because Qatar takes espionage very seriously. And spying for Israel, it's a one-way ticket to the gallows. So this release is a big diplomatic win for India, a victory for quiet and mature diplomacy. And now let's turn our attention to Indonesia, the biggest country in Southeast Asia, home to the biggest Muslim population in the world and the fourth most populated nation after India, China and the US. This behemoth is days away from the biggest election on the planet. On Wednesday, February 14th, Indonesia will go to polls, the largest single-day election ever conducted. More than 205 million people are eligible to vote. They will choose their next president and government. And it's the youth that will decide Indonesia's future. More than half of the electorate is under 40 years of age. More than half. About a third of the eligible voters are under 30. So make no mistake, this is an election for Indonesia's future and by extension the future of Asia. This is a general election. Indonesians will be voting for every single level of government, both the upper and the lower houses of parliament, regional and city level legislatures, and of course, their president, their next president. And that is the biggest and most hyped up contest. Indonesia's current president is Joko Widodo, popularly known as Jokowi. He won the presidency in 2014, and he has overseen a period of economic growth for his country. His efforts have made him very popular. His approval ratings have regularly been more than 70%. Even towards the end of his 10-year stint, he remains very popular. But Jokowi has to step down now. His two-term limit is up. Someone else must take over now. Three candidates are vying for this job. We begin with Anis Baswedan. Jokowi's former education minister, and after that, the governor of Jakarta. We do not want a country that's arrogant towards its own people. We don't want a country that's greedy to its own people. We don't want a country that's inhumane towards its people. We want a country that loves and protects and helps its people. He's running for president without a party. He's contesting as an independent. He has vowed to safeguard Indonesia's democracy and has a dedicated campaign staff that stands out. His four cats. He's been using their videos to appeal to Indonesia's young voters. After all, who doesn't like cat videos? So that's Anis Baswedan for you, the first candidate. Next, we have Ganjar Pranovo, the ruling party candidate. Ada yang sakit hati. We apologize for anyone hurt by our words. We hope peace can be brought by our campaigns. We hope nobody takes anything to heart and that we will closely pay attention to what the people of our nation have said. We have empathy and integrity to improve Indonesia, to be as great as what our founders wanted. He is the official successor to Jokowi. He has experience as the governor of central Java and he is expected to maintain the policies and economic momentum of the Jokowi regime. Both these former governors have run vibrant election campaigns, but they're both currently fighting for second place. They're miles behind the front runner, which is this man, Prabowo Subianto, a 72-year-old former general who's been dancing his way into people's hearts and to the top of opinion polls. This is his third time fighting for the presidency. He twice fought and lost to Jokowi in 2014 and then again in 2019. He fought both those contests. But third time could be the charm for this erstwhile strongman. He has softened his image and run a phenomenal social media campaign. He's now seen as a lovable grandpa. And this has endeared him to the Indonesian youth. So how has the popular Jokowi's one-time rival become his most likely successor? His running mate holds the answer. Prabowo Gibran and the Indonesia Maju Coalition are fighting to eliminate poverty in the Republic of Indonesia. To bring prosperity to all Indonesians, we will continue what the previous presidents have built. Prabowo Subianto is running with Jokowi's son. 
Gibran Raka booming Raka. The outgoing president has refrained from making a direct endorsement, but he's accused of tacitly backing his son over his party in this upcoming election. The most recent opinion polls show them in the lead. The Prabovo Gibran pair have more than 50% of the vote which means they could win the presidential election outright. But if they don't cross the halfway mark, there will be a runoff in June. As things stand, they are in the clear. They should win. The period for campaigning has ended. The final decision now rests with the people. Wednesday, we'll see the biggest election day in the world. And we'll be keeping you updated on this story. Now let's talk about the Israel-Hamas war. It's in its fifth month. Casualties are mounting, but Israel has a new plan. Prime Minister Netanyahu wants the military to storm Gaza. His focus this time is Rafah, the southernmost city in the Gaza Strip, and the last refuge for fleeing Gazans. Israel has already launched airstrikes there. A ground offensive may happen soon. Israel's allies want this to be called off. They have issued strong warnings, but Netanyahu remains steadfast. He wants to dismantle what he calls the last battalions of Hamas. Is that his only objective, though? Why does he want to storm Rafah, and why is it a red line for his allies? Our next report tells you. This is the city of Rafah, located in the south of the Gaza Strip straddling the border of Gaza and Egypt. Three months ago, it was pegged as a safe haven, the final place of refuge for Gazans. Right now, it's home to 1.4 million Palestinians. They have fled the war in the north, and this is where they are seeking shelter. But is Rafah safe anymore? Last week, the Israeli Prime Minister announced a new offensive, this time in Rafah. He asked his military to enter the city to dismantle what he called the last bastion of Hamas. The airstrikes have already begun. It targeted different parts of the city. Over 100 people have been killed. The casualties could rise further. Several people remain trapped under the rubble. Israel also launched a special operation. This was to rescue hostages. Over 100 Israelis are still being held hostage. Israel managed to rescue two from Rafah. In a joint rescue operation of the IDF, the Shin Bet and the police SWAT team, we rescued Louis Hare and Fernando Marmon, who were kidnapped from near Yilzak by Hamas on October 7th. This was a complex rescue operation under fire in the heart of Rafah. A full-scale ground offensive is still on the hold. But Netanyahu says that it will happen soon. His allies are concerned. They are warning Israel to not go ahead with it. The UK says half of Gaza's population is there. The Netherlands has warned of civilian casualties. Saudi Arabia has warned of consequences if Rafah is stormed. And the US said it will be a disaster. So will the Rafah offensive be a red line for Israel's allies? Washington, its strongest ally, wants Israel to come up with an evacuation plan before it launches any offensive in the city. But Netanyahu remains steadfast. The answer lies in his political fortunes. The war is now in its fifth month. Over 28,000 people have been killed. Half of Gaza is under rubble. Netanyahu says victory is within reach. Yet, he hasn't fulfilled his primary objective, getting the hostages back home. Israel has bombed hospitals and residential areas. It has uncovered Hamas tunnels. Yet the hostages, except for the two rescued, remain out of reach. Plus, Netanyahu's popularity is sinking. The opposition wants him out, and so do the citizens. Moody's has downgraded Israel's credit rating. People want Netanyahu to take public responsibility for the October 7th attack by Hamas. They blame him for the security failures. So the Israeli Prime Minister is embattled. To survive, he needs a big win. That can only happen if the hostages return home which explains why Netanyahu is pushing ahead with the Rafah offensive. So will it work out? Rafah is overcrowded right now. Any offensive would lead to hundreds of casualties. And if the hostages are there, they could also lose their lives in the process. Plus, the Allies are not enthusiastic about the plan. But the fact of the matter is, they can issue all the warnings they want,
but Netanyahu is most likely to go ahead with it. The Israeli Prime Minister is looking for victory and Rafa seems to be his best chance. Donald Trump. It's a name and headline rolled into one. What's he done this time? Trump has just openly trashed America's most important alliance, NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. NATO has a lot of rules and obligations, but the most important one is this. An attack on one is an attack on all. I'll give you an example. Assume Russia launched an attack on Germany. Now, Germany is a NATO member. So the attack on Germany will be considered an attack on all 31 NATO members, meaning all of them will respond. It won't be Germany versus Russia. It will be NATO versus Russia. That commitment is the bedrock of this alliance. That's why Finland joined last year, why Sweden is joining this year, why Ukraine refused to be neutral. They all want the NATO security cover. But Donald Trump doesn't care about it. This weekend, he was campaigning in South Carolina and he narrated his conversation with a NATO member. Listen to this. Well, sir, uh, if we don't pay and we're attacked by Russia, will you protect us? I said, you didn't pay? You're delinquent? He said, yes, let's say that happened. No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. You got to pay. You got to pay your bills. What does that mean? It means Donald Trump won't protect a NATO member if they're attacked, not unless the country pays the bills. And which bill is that? Well, NATO members have an unofficial military spending target. 2% of their GDP. That's what they must spend on defense. 2% of their GDP. But many NATO members don't hit that target. So Donald Trump says he won't defend them. In fact, he goes a step ahead. He says he will encourage others to attack them. Again, let's talk examples. In fact, the same example works still. Germany. Germany did not spend 2% of its GDP on defense in 2023. So Trump would encourage an attack on Germany. At least that's what he claims. Now, European officials are in shock after listening to Trump. Even top ally Britain is concerned. Let's be serious. NATO cannot be a, a la carte military alliance cannot be a military alliance that works depending on the humor of the president of the US on those days. In this world where we've seen Putin's terrible illegal invasion of Ukraine. And actually NATO this year has got stronger with Sweden and Finland joining. Of course we want all countries like us to spend 2%, but I think what was said was not a sensible approach. The White House has called the comments appalling. The NATO chief has also criticized them but coming from Donald Trump, it's important. This is a man leading the US presidential race. He could be president by this time next year. So what he says is important, no matter how outlandish it may sound. So let's focus on two obvious questions. Number one, can you really not defend a NATO member? And two, if the US walks away, what can Europe do? Let's look at Article 5 of NATO. That's the article dealing with collective defense. And this is what it says. If an armed attack occurs, each of the members will assist the party or parties so attacked by taking such action as it deems necessary, including the use of armed force. So military response is not necessary. Trump may decide that financial support is enough or maybe just political support. And some NATO members already do this. Iceland, for example. Iceland does not have an armed force. So technically, Iceland cannot defend a fellow NATO member. No reason Donald Trump can't do the same if he becomes president. Of course, that the fallout would be huge. European allies will likely tear into the Americans. They will also be humiliated and shamed. Now to the second question. How can Europe prepare for this? Frankly, it's a question the leader should consider. It's easy to condemn Trump and move on. But the fact is, he represents a big chunk of US voters. This is how a lot of Americans think. What if they're fed up of defending Europe, of being the hammer of NATO? So it's a wake up call for European nations. They can't blindly depend on the US for, for security. They must look out for themselves. And that's what Estonia is calling for.
So I think uh, it still is is the plea for for everybody to do more. Uh, and I think what uh, um, the presidential candidate in America says is also uh, something to maybe uh, wake up uh, uh, some of the allies who haven't done that much. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully we all do more, and collectively uh, we are stronger uh, together. The numbers support this. The EU's defense spending is around $260 billion. That's 27 countries in total. And how much does the U.S. spend? $877 billion. Of course, the U.S. is a much bigger economy. It's also a self-proclaimed superpower. So their requirements are different from Europe's. Having said that, the sentiment is shifting. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is changing things. Europe is now more worried about its safety. Six EU countries increased their defense spending by 10%. Sweden increased by 30%. So the direction is upwards. Does that mean Donald Trump is right? I'm afraid it's not that simple. Yes, America spends more, but that money also gives the U.S. influence, a lot more influence than any other country. If the money goes, so will the influence, which is why Donald Trump will find it hard to walk the talk. He tried NATO skepticism in his first term as well, but eventually he had to back down. Expect the same with this rhetoric. And now let's turn our attention to the coup hit Myanmar. It's been embroiled in chaos for months now. The military junta is losing control and with it losing ground in many parts of Myanmar, including the state of Rakhine. It is in the grip of violence. Both India and Bangladesh have consulates here. India has already evacuated its officials. Now Bangladesh is doing the same because tensions are only escalating. On Saturday, the junta announced compulsory military service. It will require all young men and women to serve at least two years. But will this solve their problems? Can they defeat the advancing rebels with conscription? Here's a report. Myanmar has seen a turbulent past. In 2021, the military junta took control of the nation, embroiling the nation in chaos. plunging it into a state of emergency, killing thousands, displacing over a million. Since October last year, Myanmar has been in the grip of violence. Ethnic militias have been fighting the military, and in recent months, the latter has faced a series of humiliating defeats. At the end of last year, three ethnic insurgent armies in the Shan state captured border crossings. These crossings and roads carry most of the land trade with China. Last month, the ethnic groups took control of Paletwa. It was the last military post in the strategically important township. The rebels are in charge of all major towns, and now they are fast gaining control of the state of Rakhine, which makes the situation worse for the military. Rakhine is important from a diplomatic standpoint. It borders Bangladesh and is close to India. So its capital of Sitwe has consulates of both the nations. Tension is high on the border. The surge in fighting has seen civilian casualties. Recently, India evacuated their officials from the Rakhine consulate. Now, Bangladesh is following suit. It wants to evacuate officials and temporarily shift the consulate to Yangon. So the picture isn't pretty. The junta is losing ground. Its diplomatic woes are piling up. Its defeats and retreats have sparked criticisms. On Saturday, the junta made an announcement. The People's Military Service Law, enacted as Law No. 272010 of State Peace and Development Council in 2010, shall come into force starting from 10th February 2024 the junta has enforced a compulsory military service law. It requires all men aged 18 to 35 and all women aged 18 to 27 to serve at least two years under military command. Specialists such as doctors aged up to 45 must serve for three years. No further details have been released so far, but those ignoring summons to serve can be jailed for the same period. Myanmar has had a conscription law since 2010, but it has never been enforced, that is, until now. It is a clear sign of the junta's desperation. The military hopes that bigger numbers can save it, 
can help it control the fighting. But will it work? The ethnic armies are too far down the road to give up now. Only time will tell if conscription can stop the advancing rebels. The biggest fear is the fighting in Myanmar could spill over. Now let's move to another state in anarchy, Senegal. Once known as West Africa's bastion of democracy, Senegal's reputation is now under threat. Last week we told you how the upcoming presidential election had been postponed. It was supposed to take place on February 25th. But with less than three weeks to go, President Macky Sall postponed it. It has been pushed to December now, meaning Saul won't give up power for at least a few more months. And this has led to mounting anger in Senegal. That anger erupted over the weekend. If we are here, it's because of President Macky Sall, who dared to touch our constitution. People are saying Senegal is experiencing a coup d'etat. It's the first time it's happened and it's under President Macky Sall. He's the first president to stage a coup d'etat here at Haim. People started taking to the streets on Friday and they began clashing with the police. These were the scenes in the capital, Dakar. Protesters pelting stones, the police responding with tear gas. The demonstrators were undeterred though. They marched towards the security forces, proudly brandished Senegal's flag and they kept chanting. <laughs> They're chanting, Mackie Saul is a dictator. These protests took place throughout the weekend in the capital, Dakar, and other cities. At least three people have died in the violence, but it shows no sign of dying down. We are ready to give our lives so that the people can be freed, so that Senegal can rid itself of Macky Sall. The situation in Senegal has sent alarm bells ringing around the world. The United Nations has weighed in asking all stakeholders to follow the country's constitution. The West African regional bloc, ECOWAS, has spoken to asking Senegal to quote-unquote urgently restore the electoral calendar. ECOWAS head and Nigerian president, Bola Tinubu, was set to meet Senegal's leader today, but that meeting was abruptly called off. There's a lot at stake for the region. It has seen a string of coups in recent years, and Senegal was supposed to be the exception. It's West Africa's shining light of democracy, the most stable country in the region. So Macky Sall's decision to postpone the election has sent shockwaves across the region. Sall, however, is defiant. He says he has done only what was necessary. You are right that West Africa is currently in an extremely difficult time and it's not a time that I should finish my term and reinvent myself in a new career as a dictator or non-democrat. That's a picture they are painting, but it doesn't correspond to my profile or my personality and that doesn't correspond to reality. That's what Mackie Saul said in his first interview after the election delay was announced. But his record doesn't really hold up. Two of Senegal's major opposition leaders have already been barred from the election. Popular youth leader called Osmane Sonko, who's in prison, and Karim Wade, the son of a former president, both barred from the polls. But it seems that wasn't enough. Macky Sall then postponed the election. He said there were still electoral issues, issues with the list of presidential candidates. Some 20 candidates had qualified for the February election. And they're not pleased with the delay. About 12 of them have come together. They're uniting against Macky Sall and challenging the election delay in court. Those 12 and 13 of us, what we've decided is this. This is not about a political party. We decided to take away any colors from our parties. There's only one color. It's Senegal. We have one goal now. It's to make sure that President Macky Sall does not um, conduct his third mandate and we go towards the election. One challenge was lodged on Friday, another appeal was scheduled for today, all against the election delay. A decision is expected this week, but will Macky Sall obey the court verdict? He refuses to say. Senegal is on the edge, with people waiting to see if their cherished democracy will remain, 
or if Senegal will become the next African dictatorship. Our next story is about Elon Musk, the poster child of bizarre ideas. Musk wants to build tunnels under cities, send his car to space and engage in hand combat with Russian President Putin. But like him or hate him, you cannot ignore his plans, including his new plan. Elon Musk now wants to colonize Mars. He wants to establish a human colony on the red planet. He says it will have one million settlers. And how will they reach there? Via his SpaceX Starship rocket. But is this plan viable? And can humans really build a colony on Mars? Our next report explores. Lush dome structures, chrome cable cars, humans in spacesuits, and a cosmic commute. Elon Musk has a new plan and it's to colonize the red planet, to create a human colony on Mars. He wants one million people there by 2050. Of course, this isn't a first. There are books about living on Mars, films about life on the red planet. Space agencies want to explore the idea. Corporations want to fund it. And now Elon Musk has come out with his game plan. The first obstacle is reaching the red planet. Musk has a solution. He's depending on his own company, SpaceX. He says the Starship could take people to Mars, almost like a daily flight. It sounds very life-changing, but there are a few problems with that. First, the Starship has its own challenges. Its recent flight ended in an explosion. Musk says there will be a new test this year, but currently, progress remains slow. But for a moment, let's imagine the Starship works. What happens after that? Musk says the first few flights will be unmanned. Then, people will be sent in. Not everyone, just a handful. On the red planet, they will try to convert water and carbon dioxide from the surface of Mars and turn it into liquid oxygen and methane. This fuel will power the Starship's return journey to Earth. After that, Musk plans to send more people in the thousands. They will have only one job, build colonies and factories. This is to make the red planet self-sustaining. There was also the talk of giant glass domes to try and heat up the planet. Of course, all this sounds very sci-fi, but is it legitimately possible? The first problem is the atmosphere on Mars. Musk wants to terraform the planet. It's a process to make the planet warmer and wetter, much like our own planet Earth. But is it really possible? Scientists say they don't know if Mars has enough carbon dioxide to achieve that. The other problem is getting people there. Musk is living on the assumption that people want to leave planet Earth. But why would they? Life on Earth may have its fair share of problems, but it isn't bad enough to take a rocket to Mars. Musk wants to put the first person on Mars by 2029. But Starship hasn't yet left the Earth's orbit without blowing up. And even if people do get there, no one knows how they will sustain themselves there. We know very little about the long-term effects space has on the body. Nobody has spent time in space for more than 437 days in a row. So how do you expect them to stay on Mars permanently? There are also questions about gravity and how the human body will adapt without it. Forget interstellar fashion. Spacesuits will be your best friend. You will be in the chunky gear day in and day out. Unless you're in the starship. Then, there's the question of basic necessities like food and water. At least at the start, they will have to be shipped from Earth, and that will have a hefty cost. So, the mission sounds great, at least as a headline, but challenges loom over the idea. Elon Musk may want to do it, but his Martian escapade still has some big loopholes. What is the foolproof method to learn a language? Language professionals are often asked this question, but their answers differ. Some say practice speaking with a friend, others suggest visit the country and fall in love with the language. There is no singular right answer here, but most recommendations share a common thread. The one thing that is crucial to learn anything, motivation, the desire to do things. Study after study tells us how to stay motivated. Look at Maslow's hierarchy of, ne of needs. You may remember this from school. This is a theory of motivation. 
It shows five areas of human needs that dictate how motivated we stay. At the basic level is psychological needs. For example, if you're hungry, you're motivated to find food. Then come safety, belonging, esteem, and self-actualization needs. But if you aren't much for studies, there are motivational speakers. The global market for motivational speakers is reportedly worth $7 billion, beat that. But if you want to avoid the hassle, there are YouTube videos, TikToks, and Reels. And if you aren't motivated enough to listen to those either, there are motivational posters, WhatsApp forwards, videos, mugs, stationery, because the business of motivation is massive and the market seems ever-expanding. According to a recent global survey, 60%, 60% of workers feel unmotivated in their jobs, especially on Mondays. Pardon the pun. Surveys say Monday is the worst day of the week for many. Millions of people the world over hate Mondays. According to a 2020 study, most employees feel emotionally compromised on Mondays. They have lower levels of job satisfaction, high levels of job stress, and very little motivation to work. That's what people call Monday blues. It's when you feel down at the start of the week. But are Monday blues a real thing? Scientifically, if, scientifically speaking, they, they aren't. Monday blues is not a medical term. According to research, they are the repercussions of weekend choices, like waking up late or socializing too much. So Monday misery is actually a choice. Can we get a dose of Monday motivation despite feeling the blues then? Scientifically, how do we stay motivated? Let me go back to the example of language. After childhood, learning a new language is hard, but it can be done. Some learners who do it are internally motivated. They might want to talk to a friend in their language. Others might be externally motivated, meaning their motivation stems from outside sources like wanting to ace a language test. In most cases, motivation is impacted by a combination of these two, internal and external motives. A mix that works for you increases your chances of success. And I say chances because motivation does not promise anything, let alone success. Most people who achieve success are strongly motivated, but not everyone who is motivated manages to succeed, which is why motivation is so elusive. And if you too find it hard to achieve, here's some Monday motivation for all of you. Get started either way, whatever you have, start. People say motivation is the energy that gets us to take action, but science disagrees. It says motivation is often the result of action, not the cause of it. So getting started, even in very small ways, is a form of actively feeling motivated. If you keep waiting for motivation, you might have to wait forever. And if all else fails, you can always leave post-it notes everywhere telling you to just do it. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. Rio de Janeiro is in party mode as the world's biggest carnival kicks off with elaborate parades and dances. In Hong Kong, fireworks light up the Victoria Harbour to mark lo the Lunar New Year. And it was a Super Bowl Sunday for America as Kansas City Chiefs celebrated their second consecutive Super Bowl title. Finally, we're taking you back in history on this day in 1996. Yasser Arafat took office as the first Palestinian president. He was a towering figure for Palestinian statehood. His death in 2004 left a void in the movement that is yet to be filled. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. been done in uh, all the Palestinian territories.
Chase! 